go from like yes to time and a word, from time and a word to the yes album, from the yes album to the fragile, and then bang, you hear it close to the edge. Boom, three pieces of music, um, you know, and a lot of people will probably say the best yes album ever. For me, uh, the, the uh, yes album fragile, um, close to the edge kind of trilogy w w was uh, establishing uh, the styles and the direction of yes. When yes made close to the edge, they were kind of, in some way, I suppose, confirming the end of the 60s and the move into a kind of music that uh, was going to be developed through the first half of the 70s until punk drew a line under it. trying different sounds, different things, um, and I think that that is partly why it's, it's the album it is, you know, because they, they, they did have this, it felt like they had endless amounts of time to do this album, to make this album. I think this album, uh, Close to the Edge, put Yes on the international map and allowed them, even with the breakups and the reforming, the breakups and the reforming, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to be a band that is still functioning and working today, a long time after this album was made. You listen to something like Close to the Edge, and, and you can listen to it as enjoyably today as you could back in 1972 and it really doesn't sound it you put it on today and you don't think blimey this is an old record isn't it it's like wow what a great piece of music and that's the difference and so it is rock and roll in a strange way If you go back to the very beginning of Yes Records and then trace their, their musical ideas through to Close to the Edge, you can see, you can start to see that the, the basic song structure was beginning to change, especially on Fragile, where you were getting more musical interludes, and uh, they took that to its nth degree in Close to the Edge. If you really want to define where Yes really truly began as a band we all know and love today, you have to go to the Fragile album, which was their fourth release, because this was a release that brought together Bill Bruford on drums, Rick Wakeman on keyboards, Steve Howe, guitar, Chris Squire bass, and of course John Anderson on vocals. It was the first album they worked on together, and you can hear in Fragile work in progress. take Roundabout as, as the prime example of what they were doing on Fragile, then, um, I mean, it's interesting to note that that was also pulled off the album as a single in America. Um, and that, it's very often that particular track that's cited as 
opening up the band to a massive audience um, because it is kind of accessible it's kind of sort of funky and catchy roundabout and, and yes weren't really considered a sort of catchy kind of band a lot of the prog rock bands in the early 70s like Emerson Lake and Palmer and Genesis and yes um, although I mean they were melodic the sort of commercially viable harmonies weren't the sort of things you were finding on their records. Um, so roundabout, for Roundabout to work outside of the context of Fragile was the perfect stepping stone yes needed to sort of like make themselves uh, very quickly the most popular progressive rock band of that era. It's starting to explore the areas that were to become known and loved on Close to the Edge, that ability to mesh and meld heavy rock almost industrial music with jazz inflections, classical aspirations and of course those soaring vocals over pseudo-intellectual hippie dippy airy fairy lyrics however you want to describe them maybe mystical and roundabout of course is the track that everyone knows and loves on that record and because it's got so much light and shade and seems to flow so naturally and freely that really was the birth of Yes as we know it. And although, of course, it ended up on Fragile, not close to the edge, it would not have been out of place on the latter. On the previous album, Fragile, uh, it's interesting how different the writing pattern is. You've got about three tracks that are cooperative ventures and five tracks which are individual. They're basically solo tracks on a Yes album. And they're not so good because of that. They're kind of entertainments, divertissement even. Uh, but they're not full on band tracks. Come to Close to the Edge and you have a real band album. They made Fragile in mid-71, released early 72. In early 72 they went in and made Close to the Edge. So they got to know each other as individuals and as musicians. They'd had a dry run as it were with Fragile and said okay now we know where we can go, now we know our strengths and weaknesses. We can take it one step further and really open up everything, really just go for it. Because I think in Fragile there's a certain diffidence on occasion as if they're feeling their way, looking at each other to see, okay, is what I'm doing fitting with what you're doing? I think by the time they got to Close to the Edge, you were much more confident. They spent months and months and months there, and I, I wasn't there for months and months, you know. I was there on and off occasionally. So I rarely saw any actual music being played. I, I saw, I, one night, I spent hours watching uh, Bill Bruford hitting this but it's this massive symbol. It's like what you used to call them dustbins, you know, massive thing. And that, that was about it. And they just couldn't quite get the timing of this this, this, this symbol. Um, but what I heard most of the time was a lot of the, the, the early playback stuff, you know, when they were mixing. And it was, you could tell, it was, it was unbelievable. It was the, there was this power to it, which I, I don't think I'd ever heard before. I think Close to the Edge, as, a, as an album, mm -hmm. was probably the best overall picture. Mm -hmm. um, Fragile was just before it, was, mm -hmm. which was a good stepping stone to what I thought was basically what Yes as a group was all about. It was a very good picture of a band uh, being able to expand musically. We're talking, you know, 1971, 1972, prog rock we really only just got going and yet Yes were sort of streaking ahead. You know, Genesis was still catching them up. Floyd hadn't even created their masterpiece. King Crimson had sort of done some good work and then were kind of wallowing around, didn't really, you know, trying to work out what it is they wanted to do. Yes, we're up and away going, see you guys, and sort of streaking ahead. He couldn't hold them back. I mean, you know, in the space of two years, Yes had done the Yes album, Fragile, and Close the Edge. Um, you know, three of the greatest progressive rock albums of all time.
For Yes to do an album with three tracks, as they did with Close to the Edge, was a very brave move at the time, even though we, it was in an era where artistic integrity was so important to most musicians. Still, they did an album which side one was just one track, 18 minutes plus, called Close to the Edge, albeit divided into four chapters, four parts, and I'm convinced there were two reasons why they divided it up. One was pretentious because, oh, all the great symphonies have different movements, so we'll have different movements. The other was probably pragmatic. You can imagine going into the record label and saying, oh, we've got this 18-track title song for the album, which is going to take up the whole of side one of what was in vinyl. And the record label Atlantic going, oh my god, what are you doing? This is crazy. You're just building a following. You're, you're mad. So what they did was say, well, we've actually got four songs. It's parts one to four, so we got four different parts of what is ultimately the overall track. When we first recorded Course of the Age, it took us a long time, it took us two months as a track. Oh. And then we played it. I remember playing it at um, Crystal Palace mm. in London, and it seemed like we were there for four days <laughs> playing this piece of music. It seemed ages long. Close to the Edge was a song that I began writing literally about living next to the River Thames, you know. So, but John converted that into a song about the world, if you like, and that's, that's I suppose, that's an indication of artists working together, is that you, by the time you've pulled a couple of ideas, you haven't got something that's twice as good as the first idea, you've got something that's multiples, you know, the square root of two, you know, it's multiples better than two good ideas, because, you know, it's got that, that kind of inner explosion. The track itself, Close to the Edge, um, I mean, it's a masterpiece in, in that it's epic. I mean, it's sort of 18 minutes long. But they cram, seem to cram so much in to those 18 minutes. And yeah, it doesn't feel cluttered. And I think that's a very, um, very important thing to take into account when you're, you're talking about bands who are prepared to make lengthy pieces of music. Um, it's also catchy, um, and which again is something a lot of prog rock bands failed to get in. I mean, the actual, the close to the edge refrain is actually a very memorable and, you know, it's, it's, it's almost sort of a pop single type refrain. Um, you know, and I mean, it opens slowly, it moves into this one, the wonderful sort of the first segment and then it sort of like, it sort of mellows out a bit and then builds up again to sort of its climax. The start, I think, is probably in some ways its boldest move because the opening is really quite ugly. I like it. It's jolly lead, I think. You know, it's, it's pretty ugly uh, and it's very powerful. But it is saying to anyone who's listening, you're going to really have to get into this because we're not giving you the chorus first up. And so it starts with the bird sounds and then it goes into what is a, called a D harmonic minor mode. Um, also, it's, there's, there's a couple of other interesting things that I need to, to point out. You have what's called polyrhythms, and you also have polychords. Now, polyrhythms means that there's two different rhythms going on at the same time, and polychords means there's two different chords being played at the same time from different instruments, or spread between several instruments. In this case, guitar, keyboard and bass. And so I can illustrate only sections of that, but it gives a fairly good idea of what they were up to. So the first thing is that after the, the, uh, the, the sound of atmosphere and birds, it opens with the use of a D harmonic minor scale, which sounds like this. <laughs> A D minor chord. So the bass, Chris Squire, is is playing a moving line that actually goes over three octaves, um, whereas uh, Steve Howe, the guitar player, is playing something similar to. Lines like that against a slow moving. And 
there's that three feel one two three one two three so there immediately you have two juxtaposed rhythms and um, and Bill Bruford is playing what I would term as nearly jazz in a sense he's very busy he's doing all sorts of stuff he's playing sort of quite free within the rhythmic structure um, and that goes on for a little while and then it goes into what I would term as, as a shuffle field. So the whole thing gets much faster and it gets much more frenetic. Um, and during the middle of this frenetic section, suddenly everything stops for literally one beat or two beats. And there's a whole vast array of John Anderson's voices and then it all starts again. And then it happens again. And you know, so it's actually, that production idea is really quite unusual. Um, not unusual today, but unusual then. So that's the whole first section. no particular concept to Close to the Edge, but if you listen to the beginning of it, it's a very odd piece. It starts off with birds twittering, river flowing, or water flowing, certainly, and apparently those sounds came from John Anderson's own personal collection. And then suddenly, you've got the heavyweights coming in, the musicianship, which starts off almost like an industrial noise. It's a chaos. It's a very well-constructed chaos, but it is seriously chaotic. And if you took that section, which is about three and a half minutes long, three minutes long, and played it to anybody into Ministry or anybody into Nine Inch Nails, I don't think they'd actually go, Ugh. I think they might go, hey, we can appreciate what they were doing. It was almost proto-industrial, which leads into jazz. Not into classical music, certainly not into rock. It's a very jazzy type of feel to the whole thing before John Anderson comes in with the vocals which are almost a shock when you listen to them for the first time because you don't expect his ethereal, high-pitched tone to come in. You expect something far more gruff, far more energetic, far more in your face than what you get. So you've got this dichotomy and divergence. You've got the music, which is quite heavy and earthy, and the lyrics and the vocals, which are very mystical and ethereal. They're a five-piece band, I mean, and they had a very unique guitar sound, Steve Howe's guitar sound very unique. Um, he had a very rhythmic bass playing, um, almost funky bass playing without being funk. Um, you know, um, and then there's the expansive keyboard sound that goes with it, all underpinned by a very sort of tight, taut jazz sort of drummer. Um, and then John Anderson's voice really has always been the most obvious aspect of, of the Yes sound because it's so unique. I mean, I really can't think of many people that, that, that sort of sing like John Anderson. Um, you know, at appealing and appalling in equal measure, I guess, for people. Um, you know, it's because it's so unique, you either love it or you hate it. John Anderson's voice, I think, is very particular. And regardless of the opacity of his lyrics, he really carries it through beautifully, I think certainly throughout this album. The thing is, to coin a phrase, he has a very fragile singing voice. And then you've got that set against and within the immense power of all these instruments. John Anderson always tended to combine a sense of spirituality or the search of spirituality with a sense of just going with a stream of consciousness on his on his lyrics. The words worked at, it, at the very best, not just in terms of telling a story, because they really did in reality, but in terms of the way they 
complemented the music. They juxtaposed with what was being done. The guy who wrote the lyrics, and he's, he's obviously has these amazing ideas in his head, which he needs the other guys. He needs their input. He can't do it on his own, no way. But I think he's got an idea. Once he's written something, he can, he can like, he's almost humming it, singing it. When people ask me, how do you write music, you know, when you get together with John, how do you do it? Every time John and I get together, it's different. There's a different feeling, there's a different technique being used. Sometimes John and I will just, you know, rush in here and give us a couple of hours and put a mini disc on. And, but other times, you know, I'll give him a tape and he'll go away. And every time it's different. Obviously, John, John Ensign sings in a very high range anyway. With Chris Squire was very able to, to back him up. Um, vocally, uh, albeit in a lower register. Now, I mean, if you go back to when the Yes got together, I mean, Anderson and, 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 and Squire met um, and found that they both shared a um, similar view of, of where they'd like to take rock music, but they were also very fond of things like the, the vocal harmonies of Simon and Garfunkel, and that's why um, perhaps of all the progressive rock bands, Yes were utilised their vocal prowess a lot more. Over the years I've, I've been trying to develop a certain style, I, I still don't know what it is, <laughs> I still can't grasp what it is, but um, clarity, um, presentation obviously, and control. I think these are important things. Admittedly in the early days I used to hide it. I used to kind of say, not too loud, you know. <clears throat> I used to worry about um, the volume of the voice. Uh, Maybe because I wasn't sure of it. Mm -hmm. On stage, I, I, I always seem to have a lot more presence hmm. from my own point of view. I, I always felt very comfortable on stage. So you've got a band who are as interested in taking it as far as they can musically as they are taking the vocal approach, their vocal approach and, and, and taking that as far as they can and making it mix with, you know, the, the rock music that they're making. So the next section is where the songs really start, or the song starts. So this is the verse section. And what they're doing in the verse section is they're now using an A Dorian mode. And an A Dorian mode, if you're talking about modes, is the second mode of a G major scale. So you've got a G major scale, and they have the Ionian, which is the first scale, which is your major scale. And your second scale, your Dorian, starting on an A note. And they're using that as the basis for this chord structure, which is the verse, which essentially is a bunch of chords. Over an A root. Or so if you were improvising over it, you could be. Doesn't that sound like yes, you know? So that's the A Dorian mode that's going on there. So it's all over an, an A root. So it goes something like this. And then it goes to a G minor chord. So there's a little interlude. And then it goes back again to the same thing. What you've got, I think, is throughout a really strong drive to it. Each track with a strong thematic development, recurring themes, variations, movements, opportunities for uh, each player to stake their claim, so to speak, for a little while, but in a a way that's constructive in that it's like a new voice coming in, like there's an outstanding moment in Close to the Edge itself when uh, the big church organ sound comes in, you know, when Rick Wakeman starts to dominate for uh, well, a couple of minutes anyway and does his own 
really well developed crescendo which swings out of a church organ into a synthesizer sound which is so that's a very different change of tone and that bridges the gap into the next track you know and it's just that's just one part of it that has its own very powerful movement Rick was a very great character, flowing capes, flowing blonde hair, loved a good time, very earthy, very sort of unconnected with the spiritual world in the way that John Anderson was. But he had a bank of keyboards all over the place, or bangers of keyboards, that he would play constantly, and his sound was inimitable. His sound was very important to where Yes went, because it merged together the fairground with the concert hall and with the pub. He somehow had that ability to be Chas and Dave on the one hand and yet Arthur Rubinstein on the other hand. Remember, this is the man who played with David Bowie. This is the man who played with Black Sabbath. This is the man who was constantly in demand because he was such a good keyboard player because he could adapt his style to whatever the main artist wanted him to do and do it better than anybody else. So he'd learned a lot along the way of how to adapt and adopt. And that came in really well with Yes, because he had people who were strong personalities musically, like Steve Howe, like Bill Bruford, and like Chris Squire. What Wakeman did, he became the glue. Wakeman actually literally became the glue that held together the music. And whilst yet other people could have done it, nobody could have done it in the way that he did. I suppose it, it's, it's a measure of the, the, the talent of Rick Wakeman that, that he managed to bring all that and still fit it into what Yes were doing. It wasn't like Yes joining him and adding their music to his sound. It, he had to adapt his sound to, to what they were doing. Um, so, I mean, if you listen to, to Fragile, um, it's not vastly overdone on the keyboard front. Um, but there's certainly, certainly a lot more elements have crept into Close to the Edge. Um, but it, the album doesn't suffer for it. What it does is have recurring themes that uh, come back in different forms on different instruments uh, and it has an immense amount of light and shade any kind of uh, all sorts of moods to it and all sorts of tempos so the sheer variety is part of why it keeps your interest but then the variety has a purpose and it does move along and constantly surprise you so you've got one, two, three, four, you've got five different musical sections all in quite a short space. So although there is a song going on there, it's a song with the same attitude as the piece of music. Nothing hangs around too long and it's constantly changing. The mark of a track like that that means it's good is that you've listened to it and it's over and when it's over before you think it's going to be over and in fact 18 minutes have gone by you know and it's like oh is it over blimey you know you, you kind of get lost in it and, it and and it takes you out of you sitting there thinking oh <laughs> when's this going to be over um to sort of like just you, very, you it, it draws you in very nicely um sort of slowly and surely draws you in and the next thing you know it's all over and you're like well where did that go um, and you flip it over and you've got two more pieces of music of, of, sort of almost equal intensity and, and, and prowess. That first track has this huge physical power. Its range is far and wide in its dynamics but essentially the whole drive of it has a lot of this physical power. It's very rocking, uh, in, uh, perhaps not in an orthodox way but it, it does grab you, grabs you by the body I'd say. Uh, the next track is uh, uh, far more the uh, pastoral side of John Anderson and of Steve Howe with his acoustic guitar. Uh, it's much more of that track and you and I is uh, quite uh, light and sweet and I suppose you might say peaceful uh, as we uh, would have said back then.
For me, And You and I, which is the second of the three tracks on the Close to the Edge album, is very much about personal relationships. John Anderson keeps going back to And You and I and the way that um, people interact with each other, or maybe also people interact with the spiritual world. So it's very much about a personal relationship with another human being, with nature, or with the uh, spiritual world. Not the supernatural, but spiritualism. I think of the three tracks on the album, and probably it's closer to nature than anything else. So when he's talking about And You and I, most of the You and I stuff would appear to be a woman, a lover. But I'm not entirely sure about that. I mean, he might be talking to God. Who knows? But there's some things in there which are quite basic. 20, in 24 hours, we'll be together. You know, that, there's kind of the odd pop song line does pop out of it, which suddenly, to a degree, sort of grounds it, but not to any substantial degree. Grounded is not a word you'd basically uh, uh, think of in relation to close to the edge. <laughs> So you come out of the harmonics into this really lovely little piece of music, which is the song And You and I. And, and what's great is the, um, the bass has this, just before the, the guitar start, has this really warm, rich, fat, doom, 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 like a sort of Paul McCartney Beatles thing. And then it goes into this pattern. And basically what's going on here is you've got a D major chord, then you've got a G major chord over a D note. Then you've got an A major chord over a D, back down to the G major chord over a D, back to your D. So. It's, and that sort of thing is used, um, the Who used similar things to that. It's, it's very much a British or English rock thing, and it really comes from, I suppose, um, the, the English folk rock. There are moments when Chris Squire comes to the fore, and his bass, bass playing is quite important on that particular track, I feel. There are other moments when Steve Howe plays some wonderfully fluid and flowing guitar. He's very underrated, Steve Howe, and I think sometimes you actually listen to what he did on Close to the Edge, on the album as a whole, and you realise that in the great scheme of prog rock, he's up there with the very best guitarists around, absolutely. He clearly is the sort of player who listens and learns all sorts of different styles of playing. I mean, within Yes albums, he plays classical, he plays acoustic, he plays country, he plays rock, and he plays jazz, which is pretty extraordinary. And technically, very, very good, uh, and very individual player. So in, in rock, he was you know, very recognizable instantly, no matter what he was playing. The other important thing, I think, on you and I, is they know when to leave space. So often on Roundabout and Fragile, and on the title track Close to the Edge on this record, what they don't do is leave enough space. 
on and you and I, there seems to be an acknowledgement from all of them that sometimes not saying something is more important than saying anything. So you actually, in the end, have a chance to breathe and it doesn't just overwhelm you. And I think that's why some people regard it as the laid back track of the album. For Close to the Edge, they got an you know, ad vision working with Eddie Alford. You know, there was all of a sudden, there was mind space and musical space and physical space and it, they, they expanded. They kind of opened out. I think, yes, are very aware of space at their best of course at their worst they probably want to fill every corner um, but that came later I think their worst uh, but for sure they're very aware of space however and you and I being on the whole a quiet piece of music to me actually doesn't so much illustrate that point I see more of the space awareness in uh, sub, uh, close to the edge itself in Siberian Katru, where you do have an enormous amount of racket at various points. Well controlled racket, but nonetheless it's very noisy, very aggressive. Uh, and then at other moments it falls right out. And I think the falling out of um, big noise into a quiet patch, whilst you could say that's a completely crude uh, uh, device, kind of always has its effect, you know, it's not a device that's ever going to be uh, uh, obsolescent. And so I do actually think, strangely enough, the very noisy full tracks uh, give, show more how they use space when they're really playing well. Another point of, of the, the way that Close to the Edge works so well is that the three musical pieces don't sound like each other. Um, you know, they're all, they are all different. The mood to and you and I is a lot more mellow um, than it's sort of sandwiched in between the lengthy, sometimes up, sometimes sort of laid back, close to the edge, and the very sort of bombastic, um, almost heavy rock of Siberian Car True. Um, and you and I is a bit more sort of reflective. The middle track and you and I is fairly distinct. It's considerably quieter. There's the big feature of uh, acoustic guitar on that. Uh, more of John Anderson singing in his very mild uh, vein. So it is a, there's that distinct feeling there, obviously planned. You have the heavy, complicated tracks first up, you have the slightly quieter, more uh, sweet and soft track in the middle, and you finish off with another uh, real challenging uh, stomper in Siberian uh, Katru. Um, but still, they are of a piece, they do it is exactly a statement of uh, yes at their best at that moment, which they, uh, I think they never equaled again. <laughs> On an album like Close to the Edge, where you've got they're, they're basically showing you every, you know, they're, they're they're displaying their full hand, and it runs from this point to this point. You know, obviously, where at the, their most reflective, and that's the best thing about Close to the Edge is at their most reflective, they don't sound too fey or twee. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, when they rock. I mean, they rock very, you know, I mean, a lot of people reckon that Siberian Cartridge is probably the best piece of heavy rock music Yes, ever came up with. It goes back to the beginning of the Close to the Edge track itself, in the fact that it really goes for it. There's a rumbling feeling to it, and here's a heavy rock band. And that's the great thing about Yes over the years, is that whilst they've been known for being a little bit airy-fairy, they could rock with the best of them. And they were as heavy as an awful lot of bands, sometimes heavier than those who were called heavy at the time. They really could do that. And Siberian Katsu captures that part of what they could do extremely well.
the Siberian Catru certainly is uh, a stumping number. Uh, it gives you, in many ways, all the best of yes, I think. Uh, it does. You've got those guys really going for it, really rocking. In the yes way, you know, it's not like a 4-4 uh, kind of on the money kind of rocking in that sense. But once you let yourself go into it, uh, I think most people actually can latch on to the, the, the sheer oomph of it. Siberian Catcher is probably the funkiest track on the record, and it's the rockiest, and it adheres to rock riffs a la sort of Hendrix, and, and dare I say it, they get quite funky at times on it. So in many ways, when I first heard it, it being the last track on the album, I really, I thought this is great because, you know, it, it, it was exciting, it was as if you've heard all that, and but this is what we also do. So. I rather like Siberian Catra from that point of view. It's slightly complex and, in, 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 you know, there's different bits, but essentially I, I would say you could put it down to being the riffiest and the funkiest, the grooviest track on the album. For me, um, yes, there's so much a different, a disparate sense of music in that they could be so many different things. And what people sometimes forget is that being a rock and roll band, they understood the nature of a rhythm and a groove. And they never really forgot that. Now bands sometimes such as even Genesis and King Crimson, ELP, the other giants of prog rock, could move away from that because they felt it actually lumped them in with rock and roll and pop, which they didn't want to be associated with because it was low art. Yes, didn't care. They went out and did it, and they always had that sense of a groove inherent in what they did. I think part of it is Chris Squire as the bassist, and it was subconscious to him. He couldn't actually do anything else but be groovy. He reflects his personality in a way with, the, with what he does with the bass. It's actually, it makes me smile when I listen to what he's doing on bass, because I'm thinking, well, that's, that could only be Chris. Or as I call him, Christopher. You know, it couldn't be, any, couldn't be anything else. It couldn't be anybody else. It's just him. You know, um, he's he's talking, he's talking with it, he's talking along with it. It's and there's times when it's not particularly, it's not technical. It, it's he has amazing timing. I mean, he just has an incredible understanding of of, of timing, and that's that's instinctive. Um, it, it's it's. One time he listened to something, just one time, some complex time signature, and it's in there. It's just in there and he'll do it. It's done. They weren't afraid to utilise very odd time signatures. Um, and of course, um, up until close to the edge, they had Bill Bruford on drums, who most people widely recognise as being um, the finest drummer that they ever had. Uh, and it's certainly a case that um, Bruford, Bruford was one of those drummers who, who knew when enough was enough which perhaps, I mean, although I think Alan White's a good drummer, perhaps the, not the same could be said for him. The group had this weird, quirky um, sort of approach. It's, uh, certainly, you know, this was what Bill Bruford helped to establish in the first five albums of Yes. I think subtly, but to me very commandingly, he, because he was one of the five, he, he was contributing um, some highly original, um, uh, not only music, but actually what he thought and what he said was, was as original. So he was a very uh, opinionated musician. And um, that was, uh, the, I think, for, for Yes, one of the, the strongest collaborations we've had. Alan is, and this is not demeaning at all, but he's, he's more straightforward. And I don't mean that in a demeaning sense at all. Uh, uh, Bill was like, um, his snare, Bill's snare work was just unbelievable what he was doing. It's just, you know, driving it on, doing these extraordinary things on the snare. Um, and I think um, Alan brought part of himself, part of his own personality in, in, into the band. But I think early on, he was definitely, well, he had to be influenced by Bill because they went on tour to do the Close to the Edge tour. 
and Alan was the drummer. It wasn't Bill Bruford anymore, so Alan had to obviously follow what Bill was, to a degree, what Bill was up to. The live tour, when they actually tour it, um, the performance is fantastic. They really do a great job. It's very cohesive. It feels natural, um, which is quite extraordinary because some of it is, is what I would call at times it's a mixture of, of English folk music, um, a bit of jazz, classical music and rock, but yet they make it work. You know, and John's vocals on top of it, you know, it, it, it's an extraordinary piece of music and it's an extraordinary experimental piece of music for the time. Yes, we're a strong live band from the outset, which is uh, a crucial factor about, I think, about them arriving at Close to the Edge and how good it was, uh, was that they had constantly played in, in front of a live audience, so they never separated themselves from that notion of the music has to hit the people. It's not just happening in our heads, the music has to hit the people. Yes, we as a group, had a very, very good percentage of playing well on stage. You, you, could, you could carry it for maybe 70, 80 percent of the time, yeah. Yeah, playing good. And I was just singing along with the guys, <laughs> you know, enjoying the fact that they could hold it. And they were very dedicated. It was a rare treat. Um, because they did do it. it you know, and it, it sounded like the album, but, but live. And it was the dynamics of it. It was just incredible. The sheer, the sheer space that they created with the sound they got. Um, and that was, I think, down to Eddie as well. You know, he had this massive, massive mixing desk that was brought into the uh, auditorium. You know, massive thing. And you didn't see that kind of thing very often then. I mean, no, it's sort of de rigueur. It's, everybody's got a little mixing desk, even if they're doing a pub gig. You know, you've got something somewhere. But no, but this was, this was big stuff. It really was. And it sounded big. It sounded huge, which was why I think it, um, it took off the way that it, you know, it wasn't a disappointment after people got stuck into the album. You know, it was, it was amazing to hear this thing live and it, it yeah. No, it's, it's something I, I won't forget. The time was both ripe and ripe for bands to play this sort of music, for bands to play a song that lasted for a whole side of an album. Um, you know, the, 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 the window of opportunity to do it, to do it well and to do it right and to do it and have everyone accept it only lasted a couple of years and yes got their, their bits of work out within that time frame. One of the um, key things about an album, a CD, is, is the title and where, yes, we're heading with titles like Close to the Edge and, and Fragile were uh, quite descriptive in themselves and, and, and Roger took advantage of this and saw this as a, I think, a, as, a, as a good directive, if you like, to, um, sometimes the marriages were coincidental but quite often the idea of the slightly fragile world or, you know, close to the edge of the kind of almost impossible waterfalls and all the things that are inside close to the edge. You know, Roger did a great um, service for us to try and take that title and, and make it a visual. Close to the Edge, of course, is one of the great album sleeves because it was done by Roger Dean. And Roger Dean worked with them on Fragile, I do believe, and then worked with them on Close to the Edge. And it's abstract art. You actually look at it, and what Roger Dean did, in the same way Storm Thorgerson did, was he developed cover art that didn't connect 
to what the music was or what the band were. He just had his own style and presentation. So that the actual Close to the Edge album artwork stands up in its own right. He doesn't need to be with the album. But it also immediately makes you think of the album. I think that's the beauty of the Roger Dean work at the time. And certainly it's among his best work is that A, it's stand alone, but B, immediately makes you think, oh yes, the record Close to the Edge. It's a great dichotomy. I saw Phil Carson, who classic line to me was it is I, I I've only got two bands um, Led Zeppelin and yes but as soon as one needs a cover I'll call you which he did bless him suddenly Roger offered us a kind of fresh you know positive direction and, and that logo was starting to get in shape and that was going to become the centerpiece for, for close to the edge is the close to the edge album sleeve boring never judge a book by its cover because it might be green on the outside but when you open it up you've got that brilliant gatefold sleeve the artwork with the floating islands of land you know and everywhere you can see the edge of them all um and that's a fantastic piece of artwork but no no i mean you can't call close to the edge boring just because the outside cover is green it's what's inside that counts and i think that maybe that's the point that the band were trying to make and that dean himself you know was making with them it's landscape paint painting i i mean what, what i'm doing is i'm i'm painting places where I want to take people where they can't go any other way. And I think one's exploration of landscape, whether it's a pathway around a garden or forging a, uh, an unexplored route through a virgin landscape, it's about the path, it's about the process, and the process to me is a spiritual one. I love what Roger was doing because, because it was so off the wall. It was just Roger Dean. Hello, Roger. Here's an album cover. You know, thank you. Sort of. Good, good. Um, it was just him. He was totally into his own thing, and um, and he's still still painting, still doing stuff. Very similar, very similar style. Um, no, I liked it. I mean, it wasn't. Once again, it was it, in a way. It's like the music. It wasn't my all-time favorite bit of music. It wasn't my all-time favorite bit of artwork at all. It, it wasn't my bag, but uh, it fitted. It fitted with the whole feeling of what they were doing you know all that space it works once again that spacey thing you know where, where i don't know where he was going with it but it went somewhere i think sometimes you can put an image and then put music and it works but if you change the music or you change the image it may still work but it'll work in a different way and um, i think the f it, the relationship between yes the imagery and the music was fortuitous for both of us Close to the Edge, I suppose, was one of the crescendos, you could say, of the prog rock movement, where people were still convinced that this was the right way to go. And I think, in a sense, you could now say, well, it was. They explored. Uh, and they got to, well, they got to Close to the Edge. And then after that, they got lost. And I think much the same applies to a lot of the prog bands. Around that time, a lot of them were making their best albums and then getting lost in the complication. It got beyond them, their egos got too big, their ambitions went beyond them, whatever. And so, in a sense, I guess that remained, Close to the Edge remained their monument to the best of prog, the best they could do. It's one of those rare moments where, because remember obviously that, that both Rick Waitman and Steve Howe were not original members of Yes, uh, but this lineup in particular, although it was going to change immediately after the re release with Alan White was going to join, but this particular lineup uh, is a meeting of spirits, shall we say, both in experiment and musical and technical ability. So you've got everything there, and you know. It, it was one of those, what I like to call, chemical romance moments. It was a good working relationship and it, it all happened at the right moment. And I think that's why it works so well. And therefore, as I said, it, it has become a template for progressive rock bands. If you look at Close to the Edge as being sort of like the culmination of what Yes wanted to achieve um, musically, then, 
yeah, I mean, everything that they were doing um, on those three albums, from the Yes album onwards, was all sort of building slowly to, to what they would finally manage to achieve um, on Close to the Edge. Of course, the only problem Yes had was having done it so well with Close to the Edge, where the hell did they go after that? So unfortunately, what Yes did was focus on what Close to the Edge as a track did, which is, this is very long and allows us to experiment a lot, let's experiment a lot. And there seemed to be no force holding them back, saying, Oi, what about your sense of melody and groove and rock and roll and heaviness? Those things that made you so interesting in the first place. And they ended up doing albums like Tales from Topographic After Your Oceans, then Relay, with Patrick Moraz replacing Rick Wakeman, where they became so pretentious, so self-obsessed, so wrapped up in their own virtuoso talents, that they forgot about the audience. Definitely was unique, and, and close to the edge is the summary of the the very best of them. And that because it pulled all those uh, elements together, that those five people, which was definitely their key lineup, uh, that they that they could put together. It only lasted for a, a couple of albums, and of course that lineup then kept on changing and changing and changing. Occasionally, once in a while, it might come back to very close to those five. But uh, uh, in a sense, you know, that was that was just the perfect moment. And for all the experimentation and exploration they did after that, they never recaptured that thing that happened with Close to the Edge. <laughs> 